each example slowed down by a factor of two about ten times. But I think we just that. So, um, so what we're talking about is the problem of time and pitch scaling, and there are several different approaches. Um, uh, because it's the, and the reason that there's a bunch of different approaches is partly because of the variation in you know performance versus ex, uh, computation expense, but also um, essentially this is a problem without an exact right answer. That the there's no there's no simple way you can say well this one is more accurate than the next because the 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 the, the goal of what you want to get to it's quite simple in terms of, you know, perceptually you can say, well, I'm trying to take a piece of sound and make it either last longer or last the same amount of time but have a different pitch. But it turns out when you try and get to the, the deep signal level, it's, uh, it's a little difficult to define exactly what that means. So the basic problem in, in time scale, in time scale modification, um, a lot of the early work in this area was motivated by either trying to make speech uh, like take less time so that you could listen to, you could quickly listen through a long piece of recorded speech like a lecture. You could listen to it at, at, at accelerated speed to sort of save time. Or you could slow down speech without otherwise modifying it. And that was motivated by, often motivated by saying, well, people learning different languages, they want to be able to hear the speech enunciate it slowly so they can follow it, f figure out exactly what's going on. Um, or other kind of forensic applications where you might want to sort of examine a piece of speech to get more detail out of it. Neither of these are tremendously compelling applications, in fact. It turns out that a lot of time, you know, that we're quite well tuned to listen to speech at the rate the speech is produced, that if you, once you start making speech faster, it, you know, unless it's something that you're just trying to skim through, it's quite difficult to keep up with it, right? And uh, the language learning thing, I think, does make sense because definitely people do have difficulty following second language, but um, I don't know. It hasn't turned out to be a, a, big, a big market. Um, another way that it can be used more along the stuff that Naomi was playing is to, is to, if you have two pieces of audio that um, are on, you know, don't, are unrelated, don't have synchronized time bases, but you want to synchronize them for some reason, then you might want to stretch or adjust one to, to make it fit the other. This, um, you know, some, you could imagine doing this in movie production or something like that. Okay, so we've got this piece of audio. We want to change its duration, say. Um, and so the, the natural thing to do and the, the way a very, you know, a very, for me, a very helpful metaphor is the idea of a tape recorder where you've got a piece of tape where the the waveform is encoded as the magnetic field variation on the surface of the tape. And you've got a head which is reading the magnetic, wave, you know, magnetic field. And so obviously the, 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 amount that a certain, the amount of time a certain length of tape takes depends on how fast it's moving. And so you can just you know, vary the speed of the tape. And that's the same as uh, varying the sampling rate that you play back the, a digital sampled signal. So if you've got 16,000 samples, you play them back at 16 kilohertz sampling rate, then it takes one second. You play them back at 8 kilohertz, 8,000 samples per second, the whole thing's going to take two seconds, going to take twice as long. And if you then take that signal and try and display it on, you know, as it, look at it, as it were, on an oscilloscope, so you look at the variation of the waveform as a function of time on the same time base, then playing it slower is taking a certain amount of the waveform and just stretching it out, right? So this first half here is now at twice the length. It's stretched out by a factor of two. So what happens if we do that with a piece of speech? It'll sound like this. So that's the sound example, the football team coach of the watch for the dime we've heard before, but slowed down by a factor of two. And so you can hear it does take twice as long as the original utterance. The original utterance is like three seconds. But um, it's no longer intelligible, right? It's not even, unless you've heard slowed down speech, you wouldn't necessarily guess that that was speech at all. And the problem here is that, um, you know, what we see in the speech here, these little bursts are the individual global pulses. The regular spacing between them is the pitch of the speech. 
And when we slow it down so the spacing becomes twice as large, the pitch of the speech has also dropped by a factor of two. So now it's, you know, an octave lo too low. It's not just the pitch, but it's also the formats. These little, the little ringing in here is the, you know, the um, excited oscillation of the, of the resonances in the vocal tract. And these are also slowed down so they're twice as long in duration as in the original speech. And so all the formats have been dropped by an octave as well. And that's beyond the range that we can uh, accommodate them and recognize them as speech. So the speech loses intelligibility. So this is the real problem. We want to have something which takes as long as this slowed down version, but remains intelligible, keeps the pitch and the format structure of the original speech. So um, if we just change the speed, we change the duration and the pitch in inverse proportion, making it longer makes the pitch go down. Making it shorter makes the pitch go up. But what we'd like to be able to do is to change them independently. If we have a way of doing that so that we, um, for instance, keep the pitch structure the same, keep the pit local pitch the same, but change the duration, well, the local pitch means the spacing between those individual bursts in the signal. Um, and then the formants also is you know, the spacing between the little subbursts in, in that signal. So we want to keep the local time structure but we want to change the global time course. So we still have uh, pulses every 10 milliseconds or whatever it was, but now they're going to last, rather than lasting 100 milliseconds for 10 pulses, we're going to make it last 200 milliseconds. So we're going to have to somehow insert 20 pitch pulses into there, come up with 20 pitch pulses to put in. The uh, converse of that is to keep the timing the same, but to change the pitch. So now it's like, OK, rather than having 10 pitch pulses in 100 milliseconds, if I could get 20 pitch pulses in 100 milliseconds, then I would have uh, two, 200 hertz pitch. So I, I could, change the, could change the pitch of the speech without changing its duration. It turns out that even though this sounds like a, a converse problem, it's the, same, it's the same problem because if I did this of making it into 20 pitch pulses by making it twice as long, I could just speed it up and then it would um, be the same duration but now with all the pitch, I get the pitch change from speeding it up but the duration would be returned to its normal. So it turns out you can use one algorithm for both of these things. You basic one algorithm for modifying signal and then resampling, changing the sampling rate, and you can get arbitrary control over both time, duration, and pitch by some combination of those. So the um, the history of this technique um, goes back a few decades. This system, this is a, 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 a tape-based timescale modification system from 1954, from Fairbanks, 1954. And so what it is, is that the tape is running through here. It's just a tape loop, so it's like a tape recorder. But um, what we've got under here is rather than having a fixed tape head, which is just letting the tape go past it, we've got a spinning tape head. Now, spinning tape heads are um, they, were, they were actually the basis of VCRs, right? The original VHS type tape-based video recording because you needed, they needed a very, very rapid um, relative motion of the tape and the head. But this is, a, a, this is a different kind of tape head. There in VCRs, you have a helical scan so that the, the, the tape is moving and then the head is sort of striping a different part. Here you've got a conventional head which is reading the whole tape, but it's spinning at the same time as the tape is going past. Now, if we play the tape at a certain rate, like whatever it is, 15 inches per second, the, the sound, we record some sound on, then we play it back. Well, you know, the sound, uh, the speed of the tape is going to stay the same so that the, the overall duration of the sound coming out is going to be the same as the overall duration of the sound coming in. But the actual local waveform is a function of how fast the tape is moving relative to the, 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 the read, the playhead. So if this is spinning, then the local speed is different from sort of the global speed of the tape. And so you can get this local change in the, in the temporal structure. Because the head is spinning, um, it sort of runs out of, you know, because, because this relative motion is faster than the overall tape speed, it runs out of tape. And then what happens is you have multiple heads here. And as one sort of head disengages, the next head picks up. And so here you've got sort of a, a quarter turn of the tape around the, the head, and you've got four different reed heads here. And so basically, one, only one of them 
is in contact at any time on, you know, mostly. But, um, but as, it, as it spins, it'll be, it'll sort of shift between these, these heads. So if you think about it, if the head was stationary, then it would just be regular playback without any kind of, you know, the speed of the tape going past the head would be the same as the speed of the tape going by the record head, so it'll be exactly the same. But once this starts moving, if it moves against the, uh, you know, it moves contrary to the tape speed, which is actually different from what's shown here. But if it's showing, moving in the opposite direction, then the, 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 the heads are moving faster past the tape. The, uh, the pitch is going up. But then it's sort of it's, it'll read a little bit of tape, and then it'll disengage. And the next one will come along, and it'll read some of the same piece of tape again. Right? And so this is this whole idea of, like, well, we're going to get more signal by using these overlapping pieces. I don't know how, how obvious it is what's going on there. But this is it's interesting because this is something that we could do before we had computers, but it was kind of this weird trick that we did with, uh, with rotating tape heads. So actually, um, I think back in 1971, you know, pretty early in the days of digital audio, um, a guy, I think his name was Lee, Francis Lee, um, implemented this using, using digital technology. And so here's the idea that we have the original signal. And so now we're looking at, um, rather than raising the pitch but keeping the duration the same, let's look at keeping the pitch the same, making the duration twice as long, which is the same thing, but just playing out that pitch shifted version at half the speed. So we're trying to take this signal and we're trying to make it longer in duration while preserving the same local structure. And so what we're doing is we're going to take a bunch of short time windows, local windows, and so here, we're, we're, we're using a triangular window, and we're overlapping them by 50%. So here's the first triangular window, and here's the little excerpt of that signal, which is just you know, the product of this window and the signal. Here's the second one, so these, these pitch pulses line up. Here's the third one, fourth, fifth, sixth. Okay, so all we've done here is divided the signal up into six little short windows of equal duration. But now to reconstruct, we're going to take each one of these windows, and we're going to Rather than going from one and then having two as the next one, we're going to repeat each window twice. And so now we're going to move through these windows at half the speed. So rather than coming from this time here, window three now stretches out to here, and window six is now stretched out to the, you know, to the outer edge of this window here. Well, and then we just overlap these things, right, because we've got this nice tapered overlap between the adjacent windows. So we can add them together. We don't get any sharp discontinuities because each window tapers down to zero. And we get this waveform out here which locally has, you know, has these little format wiggles in here at the right, the right local structure. Has some pitch pulses in here and they're looking, they're looking pretty good actually. They're looking more or less like the right structure. There's a little bit of some weird stuff going on. They're, they're fluctuating in amplitude more than the original and there's some variation in the spacing. It's about right, um, but the whole signal is twice as long. Yeah. So I understand the transition between one and two being smooth, but yeah. how do you make the transition of one and one smooth? Well, uh, so we just take this one, which is shaped like this, and then we shift a second copy over and just add, add them up, right? Okay. So what happens in here, right, in this, this region of overlap between two copies of one, it's the sum of this chunk and this chunk. You know, this chunk shifted over to here. There's not going to be any sudden discontinuity because there's no sudden discontinuity in either of those signals. But at the same time, it's not, it depends what you mean by smooth. It, this, this region in here, right, it's got a little bit of, I guess this, this pulse here comes from this little pulse here, and this pulse here comes from this pulse here, right? So it's actually got two pulses in here where it really only wants one, and they're sort of there. Neither of them is in exactly the right place. And that's the problem. So let's listen to the effect of doing that. So this is the same piece of speech, which we haven't heard the original, but you remember the original. But now, slowed down by a factor of two again, but with this local structure preservation. I don't know how well you could hear that. Let me just turn up a little bit, but then the, okay. <laughs> 
So compared to the example where we just slowed down the tape, that's basically intelligible, right? You can hear what he's saying, you can recognize the, the sounds, and um, it has the original pitch. You can hear the original pitch, but it also has this weird fluttering thing going on. And that's, that's this effect, right? The, the pitch pulses are kind of not always un regularly spaced, and there's some strange kind of doubling going on, right? That, so if there is a little burst, like here's the, this little burst at the beginning of whatever it is, the F or something, and it sort of occurs twice because we, it's been laid down twice. And that, so you, you can hear that as a short echo. But it's a good starting point. So that was kind of the state of the art for a while, although there were various schemes that tried to, so the other problem is that doing the stuff in digital, you know, was, a, was not, not very easy in um, using 1970s technology. There were a number of hardware systems. I think in 19, in like in the mid 70s, the first um, harmonizers came out. These are music studio equipment that will take a voice and then produce a second voice at a, a, a harm, harmonically related um, pitch. So, you know, singing at a third above or something. And that was like this really cool technique. And those things were these. Hmm? Yes. It was, yeah. It was, so you could do that with tape, but the, the first systems that did it all in digital were were produced. It was actually this guy, um, Tony Agnello, who runs this company, Eventide, which is still in operation out in, uh, in New Jersey. That he was, uh, he was the guy who uh, put that technology together. And it, but it, to work on a, on a piece of music, you know, for use in a studio, you can't have that kind of weird mechanical effect. And so they had to come up with a solution to, to making it smooth, to actually getting true smooth overlaps. And the trick is to say, to do the same thing, so we're going to have two little windows, two little chunks of the signal that we're going to try and overlap. And we're basically going to do the same thing of like we're going to get a duration change by, um, by having more of them you know, in the output than in the input. But now we, we're, we're going to allow ourselves to adjust the exact placement of the window and the output by looking at the correlation between the the output so far and the next window to put down. And so here's, it's difficult to come up with a really clean um, notation for this. But here's basically what we're talking about with the overlap add scheme, which is we've got the output at some certain time. So L is the length of the window. And so the, the output after the nth window in the, out, in, the, in the output is centered around time ML. We've got some set of samples, plus or minus, you know, one one L, one L, L point window. So we have the output up to the M, M minus one stage, right, which is how all the samples we've written out so far. And then we're going to have X, the input signal, from um, some scaled version of M, right, so that this is the rate, so pulling at X, for, rather than we're writing out to ML, but we're reading from M divided by R times L, so it's some scale time point, so we're getting the time scaling. But we're still copying the points one by one for n. We, we've got some kind of window in here to give us our tapered window, but we have this offset here, <coughs> which is a, a small uh, trim, this idea of shifting it maybe a little bit backwards or forwards. And this thing, this offset we uh, set by finding the the offset value that maximizes the cross correlation between the output and the piece of input we're going to put in, right? So this is just the correlation, the sum over the overlap points of the existing overlap times the piece of x we're going to write in, and it's just normalized by the total energy of those signals. So it's a normalized cross correlation. And basically, that's all we're doing. We're just taking, looking at different parts of the output signal, allowing ourselves to um, shift the exact point where it comes in a little bit until it lines up. And basically what that's going to do is gonna, it's going to, if there are pitch pulses and they are pretty much aligned, it's going to allow us to jiggle where we put this new window down so it lines up with it and the pitch pulses line up. And the local pitch, stru pitch structure will be preserved. It's quite interesting. So that, that makes sense, right? Because that's basically what we saw. That the problem was that we had these two pitch signals, which are basically the same pitch, but they were just being put down in an incoherent way. And so, okay, well, we can fix that by just saying locally, 
we're going to allow ourselves, you know, plus or minus some slack, and we're going to choose the point that has the greatest cross-correlation. What happens in practice depends on the, um, the time scaling factor, but typically what will happen is that it'll, you know, as the window shifts along, it'll shift them, as the window moves along, it'll increase the shift, so it's basically keeping the, the waveform uh, in line with itself, and then suddenly that will no longer be possible because there'll be more than one, that the slack won't be enough for it to reach all the way back to keeping it in the original time scale, and it'll jump by an entire pitch cycle. If it can, it'll, you know, it'll, it'll always uh, mod change its hop by entire pitch cycles. And so even though this system doesn't really uh, analyze or recognize the existence of pitch cycles, it's, uh, it's an indirect way of making sure that the, what happens is when we reproduce signals, we always do it in chunks of entire pitch cycles. So here's, an, here's the same example, but with uh, processed by one version of this algorithm. So that, um, let me just play that again, a little louder. Football team coach has a watch, then there's a dime. So that's not perfect. There's still some echo, sounds like an echoing effect. But during the sustained vowels, it's very smooth. Like it, when, you, when you make these vowels longer, it does a really nice job of just slicing them together so that the, the vowel sounds continuous. Of course, if you've got something which is like a little burst, at the beginning of a sound, and you're saying, I want you to re repeat this, there's no way it can, you know, find some way of doing that in a way that um, doesn't involve actually repeating a sound that wasn't, wasn't repeated in the original. But uh, during the parts that can be repeated, it does pretty well. Yeah? The distortion was just from the speaker. The clipping was just because I turned it up, yeah. Sorry about that. So, this gets to an interesting point, which is, you know, I said at the beginning that there's no right answer here. That the, you know, the, uh, the picture I had at the beginning of the, uh, you know, here's a little syllable um, in the original waveform. And what we want is something that basically looks like that, has the same spacing between the pitches, but is twice as long. There's no natural right answer of what that should look like, because this is essentially a different signal, right? But um, what we've done is we've said, well, we're going to you know, take individual windows from our original signal and then line them, duplicate them, and then line them up to try and make them um, fit down properly, and then add them up and get something out so that the local structure will be preserved. But now the, what we mean by local structure is, well, whatever happens within one of these windows, right? That there's some, there's some evolution of the waveform within one window's length and that's the thing that will be preserved. But then, you know, if we make it very long, then it means like, well, we're going to preserve the structure of the sound on one second chunks. If we make it very short, it means we're going to preserve the structure of the sound on one millisecond chunks, something like that. And the only thing that uh, occurs at a longer structure than that is the part that we're stretching out. So what I, so far I've been using windows of around 25, 30 milliseconds because that's, you know, a typical pitch, pitch cycle is five to 10 milliseconds. So if we preserve structure on that kind of time frame, then we're going to preserve the, the pitch structure. But if we use a much shorter window, then we can end up trying to preserve the, um, the structure within like a five millisecond window, which is like the formant structure, but not the pitch structure, because the pitch structure, you know, if I've got one little five millisecond window which falls in between two pitch pulses, then when I stretch it out, you know, I'm stretching it out to fill in more of the space in between pitch pulses. But now the individual pitch pulses are, you know, part of the part, part of the structure is being stretched out. So let me play you these two examples to contrast it. So the first is with the longer window. Football team coach has a watch, then has a dime. Okay, so that's a pretty that worked pretty well. It just sounds sounds pretty much like you'd hope sounds like someone articulating slowly. But if we use the shorter window so that we can't capture entire pitch pulses. The football team coach has a watch, then has a dime. So that's a really interesting effect. It sounds like this, you know, guy with some pathological vocal cord thing going on. The, 
the formants are still correct, right? The formants are what's happening at this very short time structure. And so we can still understand what's being said, but the pitch pulses have been stretched apart and it's not even done in a particularly regular way because it's kind of difficult. It's having trouble putting them down. So you have this lower, sounds like a lower pitch and sounds like an irregular pitch, which is still something that can happen, but not, not really what we wanted. So the point, the point of this is just to say that because there's no really clean definition of what we want, the effect of what we get depends on this parameter of the, of the, pit, of the analysis window because that's really how we define which part of the signal we're trying to preserve and keep, and keep, um, keep the same. But if we know we're trying to preserve the pitch, then we just have to make it long enough, long enough to include a whole pitch cycle, but not so long that we start getting you know, entire words or syllables being repeated. So um, th that's the, the, so, the SOLA and SOLAF. SOLAF stands for synchronized overlap add and SOLAF is the same, just a particular variant where you keep the synthesis window at a fixed rate. Um, their time scale, the, their time domain approaches where you're just taking waveform in time. Um, and they're, consequently they're pretty computationally efficient. The computation of the cross-correlation is expensive because you have to do that once for every window, once every 10 or 12 milliseconds, and that involves some number of points that you're, you know, multiply accumulating. But after that, you just have to choose some window from your input signal and then add it into your output, and it's just a few adds and multiplies to, the, to do the tapering. But there are more complicated techniques which can give uh, hopefully better results. So one idea is to use our source filter decomposition and do the time scaling in that. When we did LPC, we mentioned the idea that, well, if you just um, slowed down the evolution of the filter, the filter coefficients, the shaping of the spectrum, you could get effectively uh, time scaling there, and then you'd have to find the excitation from somewhere else. But, you, but you know, there's nothing to stop you changing those filter coefficients more slowly. Um, so one thing you could do is you could um, decompose your signal into source and filter, use your, you know, just slow down your filter coefficients, and then use some regular timescale modification on the residual, on the excitation, to get a slower, uh, to get an excitation which is also scaled in time. You could have just applied this to the whole signal, but here you can, you know, this signal is kind of already very kind of buzzy, and so the artifacts aren't going to show up Whereas you can make this, this shaping, this uh, time frequency envelope, you can smooth it out nicely and you can reduce artifacts like that. So there's a, there's a very um, high quality um, time scaling system called STRAIGHT, which was produced by this uh, Professor Kawahara in uh, Kyoto in Japan. And he, he built that specifically so you can actually do modification on natural speech and have it still be perceived as natural, and the results are really good. I tried it on, on this example, and it doesn't, doesn't really do it justice, but here's that piece of speech modified, but in this kind of way. There are some artifacts there at the edges of the words. I'm not really sure why, but the general idea is that you hear the, the formants are all very smooth. There's no kind of uh, echoey artifacts there. So that, that works pretty nicely. And like I say, it can, it can give some, it, you, can, you can get some very high quality uh, effects like changing the gender of uh, the speaker and stuff like that. So that, that's kind of a hybrid method. The straight method is hybrid because it's got some frequency domain description of the spectral structure and then keeping the excitation in the time domain. There is a, a purely spectral approach, which is the phase vocoder, which Nayan also mentioned. And the idea here is very intuitive, which is like, well, if I take the spectrogram of, some, of, a, of a signal like this, um, the frequencies of these features that I see, well, I can see these narrow stripes, which are the, the harmonics of the pitch, and I can see these broader shadows over the top of them, which are the formants of the speech. 
And as long as I keep those at the same frequencies, then the pitch and the formants are going to be in the same place. But I want it to last longer in time, say if I'm doing time scale modification. So really it's just an image processing problem where I want to take this image, stretch it by a factor of two in the time dimension, in the x dimension, but keep the y dimension, the frequency dimension the same. And so, you know, you can do that just by like replicating the pixels, say. And you could get an effect like this. So here I've just taken, I mean, it's really just zooming in and in time, but stretching out the whole picture to the, to the right. So what we want is like, we just want, we want the signal that corresponds to this spectrogram. The only weakness with this argument is that, well, the spectrogram isn't a complete description of the signal. It's the magnitude of the short-time Fourier transform. Short-time Fourier transform is invertible, we can get back. But the magnitude itself isn't enough information to reproduce the waveform. So typically when we look at a spectrogram, there is an underlying phase function which, we've dis which we just haven't displayed. But if we modify the spectrogram representation, we, in order to resynthesize, we need to come up with a corresponding phase, set of phase values to, to, um, to reconstruct it. And so that's where the, um, the phase in, in the name, the phase of a coder comes from. The phase of a coder was originally proposed by Flanagan and Golden in 1966 in contrast to something called a channel vocoder, which basically just was kind of like the LPC envelope. It would store the energy in a bunch of different subbands, um, sort of different frequency channels, and would allow you to just transmit those, but then there had to be some separate ex excitation. The phase vocoder encoded both the coarse and the fine structural structure, but had to uh, have some different way of, model of dealing with the phase. So what are we going to do with the phase? Well, one idea is to say, well, okay, we've got this spectrogram. It doesn't have the phase information, but we understand what we want is to find some piece of audio that has this as a spectrogram. And so maybe there's some way of inferring a phase that will work. And so there was this uh, algorithm proposed by Griffin and Lim in 1984, um, which is called the uh, Griffin and Lim algorithm, where you start off with some spectrogram, the, the, the magnitude of the short time Fourier transform, where this is, you know, the short time Fourier transform is a function of the frequency and the time window. We need to find this phase to do the inverse Fourier transform. So what we do is we start off with some phase function phi of omega and t, which we can start off with, say, random values here. We apply this phase function to the magnitude function, so now we've got a complex time frequency representation, which we can use the inverse short time Fourier transform on. So meaning that we take the inverse Fourier transform for each column, then we overlap add them, we get some audio signal back. In general, this phase function is going to be wrong, right? It's going to be some random thing which doesn't give us the right result. And the way that what, what's going to happen is when we take these ind individual columns and overlap their inverse Fourier transforms, we're going to get the same problem of incoherence in the region of overlap. We're going to get some kind of phase cancellations in, in these, or you know, interactions in these overlapping pa parts. So that when we take the Fourier transform again, it's not going to give us what we wanted. It's not going to give us this uh, short-term Fourier transform magnitude that we wanted. But the idea is that by getting those overlaps, we get some kind of, uh, we get something moving towards that. And so then what we do is we take the, the, uh, the imperfect signal that we got from that stage of analysis we take its short-term Fourier transform, then we take the phase of that, and that becomes the phase that we use for the next iteration of this reconstruction. So we take the phase of our imperfect reconstruction, we then apply that to the magnitude of our ideal, our target reconstruction, do the inverse Fourier transform of that, get a new signal out you know, for generation n plus 1, and then repeat and iterate. And so what this plot is showing here is... Um, a, an illustration of the, some measure of the error between the signal and the ideal as a function of the number of iterations. And this is like the, the best case you can do, the, the ideal phase arrangement, which is not particularly high. It's still imperfect, but it's a target. But here you see different, uh, pr different starting points and then how it grows. And so we're seeing over eight iterations here. It's growing pretty slowly. 
In fact, it will converge after like maybe 100 iterations to something like this. But it's a very, it's a very slow process. So um, it works, but it's, uh, it's not um, tremendously practical, particularly given mid-80s technology where even doing this kind of time frequency processing um, for a single step is pretty expensive. To have to do it 100 times is, is basically not tractable. But this, this, this result here is um, based on a, a paper we did a few years ago where we were saying, well, maybe we don't start from random phase but have some um, version of the phase to start with, some, maybe some crude approximation. We can, we can make it a little higher quality. And um, that, that was actually the origin of the solar algorithm where they were saying, well, maybe we can come up with a better starting point by doing this uh, local cross-correlation to align the signals on the original signal. But in fact, they found that that alone worked well enough they didn't, didn't even need to use the, uh, the spectrogram anymore. OK, but how can we do this if we know the original signal and uh, we've got this problem that we've got these misaligned phases? Can we calculate what the correct phase ought to be? And that's the essential idea behind the phase vocoder. Um, and so the easiest way to think about this is to think about what happens when you process a single sinusoid. So if we have a sinusoid like this, and maybe we're doing this kind of um, short time Fourier transform analysis, so we have one window, we calculate the Fourier transform of that, and then what's going to happen is there's going to be some bin in the Fourier transform which corresponds to this frequency where we'll have a large magnitude, and it'll also tell us the phase, right? It'll say, and this sinusoid here had this particular phase at, you know, starting in this case in sine phase for this window. And then we move on by one window, we do the analysis again, and we're going to say, well, there's still the sinusoid with the same frequency, but now because our time base has shifted, the phase within this window has modified by a certain amount by the delta in, delta in the phase, however far, however far along the cycle this particular sinusoid had um, moved in that amount of time. So this, this rate of change of phase is, of course, just the, 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 the time derivative of the phase of the signal in this particular bin, which is just the frequency, right? Frequency is radians per second. It's how rapidly the phase of a sinusoid changes. And so by um, there are a couple of ways we can estimate this. We can just do this thing of taking two frames and saying, well, it changed, the phase changed by this much, and the time shift was this much, and so the, the, the local uh, phase derivative is the ratio of those two. Or you can try and calculate it directly. It turns out that if you um, write down your short time for a transform when you differentiate, uh, you get this term that involves the differential of the window coming out, and you can calculate the so-called instantaneous frequency directly from a single Fourier transform. So now what we're going to do is we're going to reconstruct this spectrogram where we're sort of basically taking this analysis that was taken at the green window, but we're going to move it to a new time, right? We're going to try and stretch it out in time. And so it's like, well, we want it still to be a sinusoid of this amplitude, but we want it to be in phase with our original signal. And what we know is, well, between these two signals, between these two times, the phase change was a certain amount of our analysis time. We're now stretching it out to be twice as long, right? We're moving, this, we're moving the gap between these two windows to be double what it was. And so assuming that this phase, this rate of phase change is maintained, then all we have to do is take this phase difference here, delta phi, delta theta, and make it twice as large, make it the change per unit time, but for twice as much time. And then that phase change ought to be in line with the original. So if we've shifted out where this window goes, but we've rotated it in phase, if it's a pure sinusoid, by an amount that is consistent with the observed phase derivative. Right, so that's the point. If we just took this signal and used the original phase, we just shift it in time, it would come out of here, and it would be out of phase. Right, it wouldn't line up with the original blue one. But if we have an idea of how rapidly the phase is changing with the positioning of the time window, 
and we use that phase modification, then we can end up with a signal which is shifted by the right amount in phase. Yeah? That's only in security That's right. So that only makes sense if we're talking about a single sinusoid, basically, right? Because what we're, what we're talking about doing is modifying the, um, just the phase. We're not, we're not talking about actually doing a time shift here. But the point is we're dealing with the short time Fourier transform, which is basically representing every frame of the signal as a set of coefficients for individual sinusoidal components, right? The short time Fourier transform is representing the whole signal as a set of complex values. Each complex value is a magnitude of that particular sinusoid and a phase shift. So that's, that's a natural way to do it. So what we do is we take the, the phase derivative for every, um, for every frequency bin, and then we reconstruct it. Now the problem is, well, what happens now is now we've got this signal here, and we want to put another, put another one on, another signal on the end here. Rather than just scaling the phase of this next signal by a factor of two, the phase difference, we have to basically say, well, now our local sinusoid is at some particular phase that we've calculated, and so it's the phase change that we have to keep modifying, right? So we have to say, okay, well, have to keep accumulating the, the local phase. So actually what happens is your original phase of your signal is kind of lost, but it's the phase change between successive windows that you, that you maintain. So that um, can work quite well. So here's an example of doing this on a speech signal. This is the original signal, and this is the spectrogram of the phase vocoder extended version. So you can see it's kind of double the duration. If we listen to that, That's typical kind of phase vocoder effect, where it is all smoothed out in a very uniform way. Um, the pitch and the formats are preserved. <coughs> What's happened is, you know, we said before, well, there's this problem. If you have a very short a click in the sound, you know, how, what's the appropriate way to slow that down by a factor of two? You don't want to make it stretch it out, because then you'd be changing its frequency content. In, uh, in the overlap ad, you might end up doubling it or something like that. Here, what happens is these clicks kind of get stretched out in time. Right, so here's, they get blurred out in time. So here's uh, the, f hmm. the foot ball, here's the B at the beginning of ball. And you see it's a, it's, a, it's a burst here. And basically that burst is now twice as long and that sounds a little bit like slurred speech that's sort of taking the, the temporal edge of these signals. But that's what happens if you stretch out the spectrogram, all these, all these sort of uh, slopes, these you know, however rapidly something grows in time on this, it'll grow at half the speed in, in the slowed down version. Now, what happens, this works, works nicely when you have a signal which is a set of harmonics. But if you have a signal like this, which is, you know, some frication or something like that, um, it's, it's, uh, it's stretching out the sort of evolution of the different little random noise, random frequency components in the noise by a factor, by the factor of two as well. And that tends to give you this metallic sound. I don't know how well you could um, hear it in that because the buzz was masking it a little bit. But it basically has this so-called phasey sound, which is uh, sounds, it's to do with the fact that the original phase has all been jumbled. And, or people, I'm not sure if people really know exactly what it's to do with. But it's, uh, it's a classic problem with the phase vocoder that you can get very smooth signals, but there's something a little bit metallic that, that comes in. Um, of course, when we're taking a spectrogram, we already know that a spectrogram, uh, the way it looks depends, again, on this time window, because the spectrogram is making this division between information that gets put in the time axis because it's within one window of the short time Fourier transform, and information that gets spread out over time because it's, it's being held in separate successive windows. So again, for the previous example, we were using a, a long time window, so we saw harmonics. If you use a much shorter time window, so now the harmonics are hidden, but they're just shown in the sort of vertical st stripes in the signal, then if we use the phase vocoder to slow it down, 
So now it, it's preserved the full man structure because that was what it's preserving in the spectrogram. But these individual pitch pulses, which are should be visible here, except for the you know they've just been lost in the reproduction. You can see them here, down here. They're being stretched out to be twice as far apart. So now this is exactly um, a simulation of someone speaking with their vocal folds oscillating at half the um, half the rate. And I guess at the same time, the decay in the formants is um, halved, which is the same as having uh, a narrower Q, right? A more resonant formant because it, it decays more slowly. So it's like they're, they're, they're Vocal folds are slowing down at half to half the rate, and their resonances are being made sharper, which is sometimes uh, it's to do it, it's associated with a sort of a, a stiffer vocal tract, but it's still recognizable. It sort of sounds like someone with a very deep voice, which is kind of a nice effect. And again, you know, it's all about whether the the difference between the pitch structure, the frequency structure, and the time structure, which is whether it falls within a single window in the in the short time Fourier transform. So the way I described what the phase vocoder is doing is in terms of considering each, the signal falling into each bin of the short-term Fourier transform as a single sinusoid. And so actually it is basically uh, a, a quick way of doing sinusoidal modeling, but you're using basically a set of fixed sinusoids, using one sinusoid per bin of your Fourier transform, and then just assuming that those things are being stretched out. Um, the, one of the problems with this is if you actually have uh, a, a true sinusoidal component, like a, you know, a harmonic of, of voice, then for the bin that's in the center, where that the bin that that uh, the DFT bin that has that sinusoid in it, you're going to do the correct thing. But typically, that sinusoid will also have energy in the adjacent bins if you're using, say, a you know a, a windowed analysis, and those bins will not be sinusoids. Um, within their frequency range. They'll be being driven by the sinusoid of the center. And so these flanking bins will be stretched inappropriately. And that's some of the cause of metallic sounds or their various approaches to try and avoid that in the phase vocoder. But essentially, why, you might as well just actually do a full up sinusoidal model. Take your um, spectrogram, identify peaks, uh, describe them by magnitudes, and frequencies, and then just stretch out that whole representation. And then the phase gets taken care of intrinsically, right? Now you describe each peak as a magnitude frequency contour. And then when you resynthesize, you are, again, integrating the frequency, which is giving you your phase function, which naturally uh, is, by definition, continuous. So we can do that you know, with, say, um, with, with uh, Spear or something like that. And so here's an example of stretching out the signal using that kind of modeling. Full team coach has a watch that is done. So again, we can get very, very smooth um, reconstructions, although here the sinusoid tracking wasn't that great, so it's missed some of these voicing parts. You heard those as kind of missing parts. I just did this very quickly um, just to show. And of course, we've got this problem that where there isn't where it fails to track stuff, right, because you've got maybe some threshold, then you have missing parts, and then when, you, when it sort of starts tracking or drops tracking, you hear that, you hear those pieces um, very distinctly. So, you know, you can try and fix that by using a better threshold or using some more sophisticated techniques to prune away your, your sinusoids. But once you've got it at sinusoids, then it's easy to, to scale out in time. Um, as we mentioned, when we're talking about sinusoid modeling, of course, when the energy is not well matched by sinusoids, you can try and model it as a, a separate noise residual. And again, that can be parametrically something that you can easily stretch out in time. So that um, is a pretty effective technique as well. Um, so that's, some, that's pretty much the, uh, what I have. We talked about um, the problem of time and pitch scale modification that is kind of easy to think about what you want, but actually quite difficult to define because it's sort of, it's much more of a perceptual idea than a signal level idea. The, there we looked at the time domain methods like SOLA and SOLAFs, which are basically just repeating 
or overlapping windows that are copied verbatim from the input so they preserve whatever happens within one window is the same. And then these uh, spectral methods that try and think about the idea of stretching out a spectrogram. The final approach um, of sinusoidal modeling is something that, um, when, if you remember our last practical before break was use, introducing this um, unit called Sigmund, um, which could be used to do note tracking, but um, also has this way where we can pick out the actual tracks, the actual sinusoidal tracks. And so the, uh, the practical on Wednesday will be doing, will be using that representation as a way, we'll be actually be using both of those things, but using the sinusoidal modeling of Sigmund as a way to uh, allow real-time pitch scaling by changing the frequencies of all the sinusoids. And then by combining that with the the pitch extraction, we can try and uh, modify the pitch to, in a signal-dependent way, to get things like auto-tuning type effects. That's what we're playing with. Okay. Any questions? All right, great. So I'll see you on Wednesday.